Brad Seaver sat staring out the window as the sun was slowly sinking. He was just killing time until he had to leave for the stadium. Glancing down at the vinyl gym bag at his feet, Brad zipped it open to ensure his glove and cleats were inside. The habit began when he was in the minors and had his glove and cleats stolen. After that incident, Brad brought both items home with him after each game. The nervous habit came from the one time he forgot to check the bag. Brad had forgotten that he had taken his glove out to oil it and his cleats out to clean them. As a result, he had to borrow someone else's glove and cleats. Brad played a horrible game, striking out three times and making two errors. From then on, he checked and rechecked his bag before every game. After checking that the tools of his profession were safely in his gym bag, Brad glanced over at the kitchen. He was pleased that his wife, Kimberly, was there. She didn't travel with him much anymore, and when Brad was home, she seemed to be gone more and more. Brad never dared to ask her where she had been because he feared she'd leave for good. The thought of Kim leaving him brought back horrible memories of his first marriage. Brad thought his first wife, Cindy, was his soulmate, but he would discover she was far from that. In fact, Cindy was frequently sneaking off to cheat with her new paramour, and then one night left him to be with her new love. But when he met Kim, Brad put that whole horrible time behind him. He loved Kim more than anything in the world and refused to believe anything bad about her. As he looked at her in the kitchen, she appeared as lovely to him today as she had the first time they met about a year after his heart-wrenching divorce. After 11 years in the majors, Brad was bone-tired. His career had been better than some, but not as good as others. He had wanted to retire after last year, but Kim had talked into signing a contract extension. And with a sense of sadness and relief, today's game would probably be his last. Even though the contract had another year to run, Brad wanted out. And today was the fourth game of the World Series, and his team, the Tampa Bay Rays, were down 3-0. The series hadn't even been close so far, with Tampa losing the first game by 7 runs, the second by 5, and the third by 11. Do you think you'll play today? Kim asked from the kitchen doorway. Nah, Brad shook his head. I haven't played so far, and with good reason. I've had a crap season. I'm only batting .209, and I've committed 15 errors. I haven't pulled my weight since the All-Star game. I'll miss the game, but I'm glad it's almost over. Even if I wasn't going to retire, I'm sure the Rays would dump me after this season. You're not being fair to yourself, Brad, Kim protested. The Rays made it into the wildcard playoffs by one game. You had five hits in August and September that won games for the team. And you robbed Robbie Baylor of a home run with that leaping catch in left field that saved the game. Also, you had a pinch hit in the second game of the wildcard series that tied the game, which the Rays went on to win. I love that you're always there to defend me, Brad said, truly pleased at his wife's praise. Yet he wondered if she would press for him to play yet another season. But let's be realistic, they're not going to play me. Still, it would be nice to get into at least one World Series game. Kim smiled. Remember, the game's not over until it's over. He chuckled. Kim loved to quote Yogi Berra's crazy sayings. He loved his wife so much, but she continued disappearing, which troubled him greatly. It was driving him crazy, but he was afraid to bring it up. Brad was terrified that if he did bring it up, she might not come back. But the season was almost over. Perhaps then, they could spend more time together. Brad checked his gym bag and then stared out the window again. The lights were starting to come on in the city. He thought back over his sometimes bumpy career. Brad could have started his professional baseball life after high school. Instead, he enrolled in Cleveland Community College in Shelby, North Carolina, to study for an associate degree in accounting. Brad did this at the urging of his father. His father had a small accounting service in Davidson, North Carolina, just outside Charlotte. Brad enjoyed working with numbers and working with his father, Henry, part-time. He worked mostly during tax season and in the summers. Brad did simple tax returns and general bookkeeping work. He didn't get paid much, but his father gave him all the time off he needed to play baseball. Brad had gone to North Davidson High School, where he was one of two stars on the team. Tim Wilson had been a pitcher for the team since his freshman year. 
He only lost seven games in four years, two of which were because of errors he didn't commit. Brad also was a starter in his freshman year. He played center field and batted .397 for that first season. When Brad and Tim graduated from high school, both were drafted by major league teams. Brad was drafted by the Cleveland Indians in the 27th round. Tim was drafted in the 10th round by the New York Mets and offered a $50,000 signing bonus. Tim promptly signed. Brad was offered nothing. Still, he wanted to sign with Cleveland and play baseball, but his father convinced him to go to college. Henry explained that Brad could continue to play baseball while earning an associate degree in accounting. At the end of the two years, Henry felt certain Brad would be drafted again, but this time in an earlier round. Brad listened to his father and attended Cleveland Community, studying accounting and playing baseball. Brad excelled, maintaining a 3.8 GPA and batting .407 in his second year. And Brad was drafted as his father had predicted. He was taken in the sixth round by the St. Louis Cardinals. Retaining an agent, Abe Schultz, they paid him a $75,000 bonus. The Cardinals immediately assigned Brad to the Peoria Chiefs, their Class A team in Illinois. Brad remembered his first day playing for Peoria. He was as nervous as could be. But the manager, Buck Springer, immediately put him at ease. I know you're probably a little nervous, Brad, the manager said easily. So, I intend to let you sit on the bench for a few days to get used to how we do things. However, in the ninth inning of that first game with Peoria, the manager called on Brad to pinch hit. Buck sent Brad in as a pinch hitter with two men on and two outs. He worked the count to three and two before blasting a home run over the right field wall. Peoria won the game seven to three. As Brad was changing, the manager patted him on the back. Good hit, you'll do just fine here, kid. Confused, Brad turned to Ray Swanson, the first baseman, who was playing his second season with the Chiefs. I don't understand. The skipper said I'd sit for a few days before he planned to use me. Tim chuckled. The skipper does that to every new player. He wants them to relax while he picks a spot to stick them in that will immediately put them under pressure. He wants to see if you have the intestinal fortitude to be a professional ball player. What if I struck out? Brad was further confused and now a little worried. He was just looking to see how you handled yourself. You didn't go up there and try to hit whatever the pitcher was serving up. You were patient and waited for your pitch. I think you're going to do great. Three weeks later, Brad learned the business side of baseball. He was traded to the Atlanta Braves, who sent him to their double AA club in Pearl, Mississippi. This confused Brad because St. Louis had just paid him $75,000 to sign with them. But quickly, Brad learned he was part of a four-player deal that sent two double-A pitchers and Brad to Atlanta for a triple-A pitcher that St. Louis immediately brought up to the majors. Two of St. Louis' starting pitchers were on the DL, and they were desperate to restock the bullpen. Pearl was a suburb of Jackson, Mississippi. And to Brad, Mississippi was a strange new world. Still, he adapted quickly and was soon a starter. It was here that he met Cindy Bremerton, a true Southern belle. They soon became an exclusive couple. However, it should have been a red flag when Brad learned Cindy hated living in Pearl and desperately wanted out. But by then, he was so in love it blinded him to everything else. At the end of the season, Brad and Cindy were married. At the same time, Brad was dealt to the New York Mets, and they assigned him to their AAA club, the Syracuse Mets. At first, Brad thought Cindy and he should spend the autumn and winter at his parents' house. However, when neither his parents nor Cindy showed enthusiasm for that arrangement, Brad and Cindy rented an apartment in Syracuse. Brad's parents' coolness to Cindy should have been another red flag, but he totally missed that also. Years later, Brad's parents told him they didn't like and didn't trust Cindy. Autumn was beautiful, but the winter was bitterly cold. Still, Brad was happy because he was deeply in love with Cindy and was sure she loved him. But then Brad was dealt two harsh life lessons. The first was that all wives were not faithful. And then Brad learned, as a professional baseball player, your value is strictly based on your batting average and fielding percentage. Spring training came, and Brad did well enough that he felt confident that they'd keep him at this level. 
It went down to the wire, but Brad was still with the Syracuse Mets when the last players were released or reassigned. For the first two months of the season, Brad wasn't a regular starter. Still, he went in as a late-inning substitute for his defensive skills and was regularly used as a pinch hitter. Brad was batting .254 at the time, with three home runs and 17 runs batted in. He also was error-free in the field. At the beginning of J. Un, Tim Wilson, his teammate from high school and one of the Mets pitching staff, was sent to Syracuse to rehab his left index finger. It was broken while roughhousing in the clubhouse. Fortunately, he was a right-handed pitcher, so the break wasn't a big deal. Still, Ralph had been placed on the injury list for three weeks. They sent him to Syracuse to pitch a couple of games to ensure he was healthy. The first day Tim arrived in Syracuse, Brad invited him home for dinner, where he met Cindy. Brad was very naive in the ways of seductresses, and he totally missed the fact that Cindy was making a move on Tim. Tim returned to New York 10 days later to take up his position with the Mets. For the next five weeks, Cindy would periodically take their car and disappear for a day or two. She refused to tell him where she had been and would get angry if he asked. Finally, Brad came home to find Cindy sitting with her bags packed and divorce papers for him. She cleaned out the checking and savings accounts and took all the jewelry Brad had given her. Cindy even refused to return the diamond engagement ring that had been his grandmother's. All the mysterious trips had been to New York City to see Tim, and now she intended to move in with and marry him when her divorce was final. She was as nasty a bitch as one woman could be. She seemed to take pleasure in humiliating Brad. If he hadn't been so consumed by love, Brad would have known that Cindy had only married him to get out of Mississippi, which she gleefully told him now. You're such a schmuck, Brad, she smirked at him. I only married you to get out of that backwater town in Mississippi, but I never planned to stay with you. Cindy, Brad fought back the tears, I thought we loved each other. Oh please, don't be so naive, Cindy spit out as she pushed the divorce papers into Brad's hands. I'm going places in this world, and you're not. Tim told me that management doesn't believe you'll ever make it to the majors. They only intend to keep you around for a couple of years in hopes they can trade you, and if that doesn't happen, they'll dump you. Brad watched as Cindy carried her two suitcases out of the apartment and his life. But the truly sad thing was that Brad believed her. Devastation was too mild a word to describe Brad's feelings. He had only had two serious girlfriends before marrying Cindy, and he had taken the breakup of both of those relationships hard, even though he had initiated one of them. But losing Cindy to Tim plunged Brad into the depths of despair. And Brad's performance on the baseball field suffered badly. Two weeks after Cindy left, the Syracuse Mets demoted Brad. They sent him down to their double-A club, the Binghamton Rumble Ponies. After two days in Binghamton, Brad was ready to quit baseball and go home. Fortunately, the Binghamton manager, Roy Miller, knew how to handle young players. He had seen it all, from homesickness to drugs, the yips, and broken romances. Roy convinced Brad to give it two weeks. Then he worked on getting Brad to transfer his depression into anger for his soon-to-be ex-wife. Roy also helped Brad get a lawyer that forced Cindy to return half the money she'd taken from the checking and savings account. The lawyer also convinced Cindy to return the engagement ring. Brad channeled all his hatred and energy into his baseball game. He went on a tear, hitting .394 for the two weeks, hitting four home runs and batting in 19 runs. Brad was fully recommitted to his baseball career at the end of the two weeks. Brad ended that season with a batting average of .313 with 19 home runs and 43 runs batted in. During the winter, the Mets dealt Brad to Detroit, which upset him at first. But after a conversation with his agent, Brad realized that Detroit intended to start him with their Toledo club, the Mud Hens, which was their AAA club. It was in Toledo that he met Kim. Her full name was Kimberly Anna Samuels. And Kim was on duty at the hotel Brad had checked into when he first arrived in Toledo. She was a very pretty woman with emerald, green eyes and silky brown hair tied back in a ponytail. But Brad treated her badly, snarling at her when she explained the hotel offered a discount for Mud Hen players, but only for a week. Since Brad had channeled his depression into anger, he pushed all women into the same category and either treated them badly or ignored them. 
Kim's smile dimmed as she offered a quiet apology and returned to the computer. For the first time since Cindy had left him, Brad felt bad about how he had treated a woman. After a few moments of awkward silence, Brad mumbled an apology, explaining he was in a bad mood. Kim's smile immediately returned, and she explained that most players either found an apartment for themselves or moved in with others within the first week. The first few days of practice found Brad focusing hard on his hitting and fielding. But occasionally, he found himself thinking about Kim. He even found himself finding excuses to stop by the reception desk when Kim was on duty so he could talk to her. By his fifth day in Toledo, Brad had arranged to share an apartment with Tyler Wilson, a catcher. But Brad stayed one more night, and when he came down to check out, he asked Kim for her phone number and a date. She happily accepted both his requests. When the Mud Hen season opened, Kim was seated in the wives and girlfriends section of the Fifth Third Field, the Mud Hen's home stadium. Brad understood that the Fifth Third Bank had bought the naming rights to the stadium, which was commonplace in all sports nowadays. However, Brad was amused by the name of the bank. He would chuckle as he tried to imagine what happened to the first four of the third banks. About mid-season, a reporter spoiled his amusement when he explained that the name came about from the merger of the Fifth National Bank and the Third National Bank. Kim became a regular, always sitting in the same seat as their relationship grew. Whenever Brad took the field or came up to hit, he would glance up to where Kim sat and smile. She always waved and smiled back at him. The season went well for Brad. He hit .298 with 94 RBIs, 29 home runs, and a league-leading six triples. Then with two weeks left in the major league season, Brad was called up to the big club. Unfortunately for Kim, Detroit's last six games were on the road. Brad's play was respectable. He was called on to pinch hit three times, getting one hit. Brad was also inserted in left field in the eighth inning for defensive purposes. He threw out a runner trying to advance from first to third on a looping single that landed between him and the center fielder. A month after the season ended, Brad and Kim were married. They rented an apartment on a month-to-month -month basis and settled into married life. But as it turned out, they had to give up the Toledo apartment and find one near Comerica Park in Detroit. Brad started spring training with the Tigers, and when the final cuts were made, he was a Detroit Tiger. Brad played six seasons with Detroit, with his best year being his sixth, where he batted .281 with 94 RBIs and 22 home runs. Brad also won a Gold Glove Award with a .998 fielding average and was named to the All-Star team. However, Brad knew he was named only because All-Star rules required at least one player from each team, and since Detroit didn't have a standout star, Brad was tapped to represent his team. Brad was very happy with his life even though they had learned that Kim couldn't have any children. It was a considerable blow for both, but they bounced back. Instead of wallowing in what they couldn't have, they lavished their attention on their nephews and nieces. Brad had a brother and a sister, while Kim had three brothers. During the winter after his sixth season, Brad was informed by the Tigers he had been traded to the Tampa Bay Rays. Brad was sad to leave the Tigers, but Kim was thrilled to be going to Florida. The next four years were good for Brad and Kim. He batted in the .270s and was a starter mostly in right field but sometimes in left field. And after the fourth season with Tampa, Brad talked about retiring. He felt it was time, but Kim wouldn't hear it. Brad always wondered if Kim enjoyed being the wife of a professional baseball player too much. Of course, she denied it. Nevertheless, Kim did have a winning argument. The Rays had a good chance of making it to the playoffs and even the World Series. Playing in the World Series was a goal that every professional baseball player strived for. So, he signed a two-year contract extension. Even with a two-year contract, Brad could retire if he wanted out after a year. The first half of Brad's 11th season was okay, but after the All-Star game, his performance began to decline. And by late September, Brad was riding the bench. But as Kim had pointed out, the Rays had made it into the playoffs and were now in the World Series. Brad checked his gym bag again and then checked the kitchen for his wife. She was still puttering around, and he hoped she would be there after the game. With a sigh, he grabbed his bag and stood up. Is it time for you to go? Kim said from the kitchen entrance. Yeah, it's time to get this over with, Brad said sourly. 
Just remember, it's not over until it's over, Kim giggled. Right, Brad smiled and replied. And when you come to the fork in the road, take it. Love you, babe. I love you more, babe. He threw her a kiss, and she pretended to catch it and place it over her heart. This was their traditional parting before each game. When Brad went out to the field to warm up, he found it heartwarming that the stands were already full of Tampa fans. But Brad was a little sad because he would miss playing baseball. Fox World Series coverage, Chip Fair, play-by-play, -play, Steve Amber, color commentator. Game 4, Bottom Of the ninth inning It looked like the Rays were mounting a comeback, Steve Amber observed. Down 2-0 in the bottom of the ninth, they managed to get two runners on base with no one out. But the Dodgers brought in their ace reliever, Scott Sharman, and he struck out the first two batters he faced. Now, the Rays are down to their final out. Jose Antonio is a .282 hitter with a .346 lifetime batting average against Sharman. He settled into the batter's box, and Sharman delivers, Chip Fair intoned. Strike one called. Sharman has been devastating on opposing hitters this season, Steve offered. He recorded 35 saves with an ERA is 1.94. But if anyone has a chance against Sharman, it's Antonio. Sharman winds up and delivers. Jose swings and fouls it off his ankle. Ouch. That's going to leave a nasty bruise, Chip. Looks like it's more than a bruise because Jose is still on the ground, apparently in a lot of pain. The trainers are out checking his foot and ankle. Oh, this is not good. They're signaling for help to get Jose off the field. We hope it's just a bad bruise, but we'll find out and let you know what the injury is. I wonder who Joe Torrance will send up to finish Jose's at bat. Steve questioned. It is not an enviable situation for whoever it is. Baseball players absolutely hate to make the last out in a game. And to make the last out in the World Series is ten times worse. Someone is stirring in the Rays' dugout, Chip reported. It looks like Brad Seaver has been selected for this seemingly impossible situation. I'm really surprised at Joe's choice, Steve admitted. Brad's had a less than sterling season. He's only batting .209. Still, he has had six pinch hits this year and one in the postseason. And that postseason hit tied a game that the Rays went on to win. Nevertheless, this is not a good situation for anyone, especially a player struggling at the plate. This series could all be over in one pitch. Brad has settled in the box, and Scott's got his signal. He wins and fires. Swing and a miss. Oh wait, he tipped the ball, and the catcher dropped it. That was a nasty curve, Steve admitted. But Brad is still alive. Scott rears and delivers. Brad fouled that one back into the screen. Brad had a good cut at that fastball, but he just missed getting good wood on it. Brad must feel like a mountain climber hanging on by his fingernails. Scott delivers, and it's just outside. Now the count is one and two. Nine pitches later. This has turned into some battle, hasn't it, Chip? I must admit that I thought Sharman would finish Seaver off in short order, and the Dodgers would take the series in four straight. But Seaver has battled to a full count. Sharman is back on the rubber after a short visit from the Dodgers' manager, Mathis. He has the sign, rocks, and fires. And Seaver fouled it into the screen behind home plate again. On paper, this a complete mismatch, Steve observed. But Brad Seaver refuses to go quietly into the night. If Seaver can wrangle a walk out of this at bat, that will be a major achievement. That would load the bases. Then a single could bring in the tying run. Sharman is set. He checks Benson, who is bouncing around at third, and fires. It's a long fly ball to deep center field. Rodriguez is back to the wall. He jumps, but it's out of here. The Rays win. The Rays win. The Rays win. The Tampa Bay players scrambled out of the dugout and mobbed Brad when he touched home plate. The fans went wild in the stands and were still cheering 10 minutes later. Before Brad left the field, he looked up into the stands, but Kim was gone. In the clubhouse, Brad was surrounded by reporters. One asked, were you looking for that curveball? 
Brad shook his head. I don't try to guess pitches because I'm not good at it. I just try to protect zones. And with that at bat, I had to expand the area because I didn't want to get rung up on a close one. I got lucky it wasn't one of Scott's best curveballs, and I got Goodwood on it. Another reporter asked, what do you think about the race chances for tomorrow's game? Well, the next game will start with the score nothing to nothing, so we have as good a chance as the Dodgers, Brad said modestly with a smile. One other thing, though. At the beginning of the series, people predicted that we would be swept by the Dodgers. That won't happen now, and that feels really good. Kim showed up about an hour after Brad had returned from the stadium. She was bubbling over with so much enthusiasm that Brad didn't have the heart to bring up her disappearance. I'm so glad you agreed to that contract extension, Kim enthused. You always wished you could play in a World Series game. Well, now you've done that and even won the game. I'm so proud of you and love you more than I could ever tell you. That night, Brad slept soundly with his wife next to him. He woke up feeling better than he had in weeks. But Kim was gone again. Where could she possibly be this early in the morning? When Brad got to the stadium, the atmosphere in the locker room had changed dramatically. Gone were the stress and bloom. And warming up and batting practice was loose and fun. And much to Brad's surprise, he was in the starting lineup, playing right field and batting ninth. Normally, this is where the pitcher would be hitting. However, designated hitters were permitted since this was an American League park. After the national anthem, Brad looked into the stands and saw Kim. She was settling into her seat. He tried to wave to her, but she didn't seem to see him. Fox World Series coverage, Chip Fair, play-by-play, -play, Steve Amber, color commentator. Game 5. The Dodgers manager, Tommy Mathis, and the Rays manager, Joe Torrance, have exchanged their lineups, Luis Javier has finished his warm-up, and the Rays are now taking the field, Chip announced. Game 5 of the World Series is about to begin. Steve chuckled. Chip, in your wildest imaginations, did you think there was any chance there would be a Game 5 in this series? If I was a betting man, I would have bet the homestead that the Dodgers had the Rays down and out, especially when Antonio was helped off the field. By the way, Antonio is done for the series. He chipped his ankle bone. But speaking of that miraculous win yesterday, what about Brad Seaver? He has struggled since the All-Star break, and I think Tampa would have released him if he wasn't so good defensively. I can't say enough good things about how Brad battled Sharman until he got the pitch he wanted. That battle of wills is something people are going to watch for years to come. And that win seems to have transformed the Rays. I watched them during batting practice. The team is relaxed and upbeat. This isn't the same team that the Dodgers rolled in the first three games. Bottom of the third inning. Okay, it's the bottom of the third, Chip offered, and Ronnie Collins is leading off for the Rays. He's a .261 hitter with 14 home runs for the season. So far, Sal Johnson has breezed through the first two innings, racking up three strikeouts. Johnson was a great offseason acquisition, Scott admitted. He's become the Dodgers' number three starter. Both Collins and Johnson are set, Chip continued. He wins and deals, strike one on the outside corner. That pitch was 96 miles an hour, Steve said with awe. He's one of the hardest throwers in the National League this year, Chip said, glancing at Steve for a second before returning his attention to the field. Johnson has got the sign, and he's into his windup. Collins slaps that into right field for a single. That will bring up Corey Williams, who has always struggled against Johnson. He's only one for 12 lifetime. Anyway, Williams digs in at the plate, and Javier is set. Williams swings awkwardly. But he got enough of the bat that it is looping out toward left field and will drop for a single. Collins pulls up at second. Now the hero of yesterday's game, Brad Seaver, is stepping into the batter's box. Listen to the Tampa Bay fans roar. Four pitches later. Steve puts the binoculars down and leans a little closer to his microphone. I have to say that Brad looks like a completely different hitter down there. Over the last month and a half, he seemed to be really pressing every time he was up to bat. Now, he looks cool and relaxed. Seaver has run the count to 2-2, two and two, 
And here is the next pitch, Chip pauses for a second and then yells, long fly ball to deep right field. It's way back, it's out of here. That ball was hit deep into the upper deck. Listen to the fans, Steve said lifting his mic slightly. Seaver. 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 Steve put his mic down and continued. Looks like they won't stop until Brad comes out for a curtain call. Here he comes. A quick wave to the crowd from the top step of the dugout. He has given the Rays fans a lot to cheer about these past two days. Bottom of the fifth inning. The Rays have loaded the bases with no one out, and Seaver is coming up to bat, Chip said his cheers began to rise throughout the stadium. The fans were up, stomping, clapping, and cheering for all they were worth. I wonder if Brad has any magic left in his bag, Steve laughed. I'm sure Johnson isn't happy to see him in this situation. I don't imagine he is, Chip agreed. But Mathis is letting him pitch to Seaver. Okay, Johnson set, and he fires, ball one. That was down and outside. Two pitches later. Johnson has really dug himself a hole, Scott observed. He's trying to be too careful with Seaver, and he's run the count to three and zero, and he has no place to put him. Johnson has the ball and is on the rubber. He shakes off two signs, but now he's ready. Here's the pitch. It's a hard line drive down the right field line. It's heading into the corner, taking a funny bounce. Matthews is scrambling after the ball and comes up with it, finally firing it into second base. But three runs have scored, and Seaver is standing on third base with a stand-up triple. Well, how about that? Steven chortled. It looks like Seaver's bag still has magic in it. Three pitches later. And Thor Grundle goes down on strikes, Chip comments as Thor walks back to the dugout. Now Roger Danby is settling into the batter's box. He was only a .257 hitter for the season but had an on-base percentage of .364, which is important if you're the leadoff hitter. He also led the club by getting hit by a pitch 14 times. He's a feisty player, Scott offered. He's known to crowd the plate, and with how hard some of these pitchers throw, that's brave or foolhardy, depending on your point of view. Johnson is on the rubber, Chip continues. He checks Seaver at third and deals. It's a long fly ball to deep center field. Donner is under it at the warning track and hauls it in. Seaver tags and trots on home. The Rays have extended their lead to 7-0. The inning ended with Bobby Sheffield grounding out to short. Top of the seventh inning. Torrance has replaced Grundle with Randy Mixon, Ship reported. So Grundle leaves after six innings having given up no runs with four strikeouts. That was a very good outing for him. Mixon's record this season is five wins and four losses. He's been used as a middle-inning reliever. But if he can hold the Dodgers for two innings, the Rays can bring in their closer, Jason Marino. I'm sure that's what Torrance is thinking, Chip confirmed. However, the Dodgers are sending the top of their batting order up starting with Sammy Bills, who is hitting .294 as the leadoff hitter. His nickname is Fireplug because he's built like one, Scott chuckled. He's fast and all muscle. And he'll try to take you out if you get in his way. He's been in two fights this year because of his hard slides into second base. Mixon is ready as Bill steps into the batter's box. The first pitch is down and outside. I'm unsure how Mixon plans to pitch to Bills but keeping it away from him is probably a good idea. Mixon is ready and deals the next pitch. Bills cracks it straight up the middle for a single. That will bring up Tad Thorne, who has had a monster year. He's hitting .310 with 39 home runs. Four pitches later. Thorne has run the count to 2-2. Two and two. Mixon goes into his set position, checks the runner first, and fires. Thorne hits a shot into the gap between center and right. Bills is rounding second, heading to third. Seaver corrals the ball and fires it to second. Thorne slides hard and is safe. That play was a lot closer at second than I thought it would be when Seaver caught up to the ball, Scott observed. He fired a strike to second base. His hitting fell off during the later part of this year, but his defensive play never did. The Dodgers have been relatively quiet until now, Chip offered. 
but their bats have suddenly come alive. And now they've got Tad Blanken coming up with two on and no outs. Mixon has dug a little bit of a hole for himself, Scott admitted. Torrance is on his way to the mound to chat with Mixon. Think he'll make a change? I doubt it, Chip. Mixon's got a good fastball and a wicked curve. I guess you're right because Torrance is heading back to the dugout, leaving Mixon to pitch to Blanken, one of the hottest hitters on the Dodgers. He's hitting .347 with 49 home runs. Not only that, Chip, but Blanken is hitting .427 lifetime against Mixon. Well, it looks like they are not taking any chances. They're intentionally walking Blanken to load the bases, Chip reports as Blanken trots down to first base. Their cleanup hitter, Ray Freeman, is settling into the box. Mixon's first pitch is a strike. A double play would be a big help out right about now, Scott said hopefully. A swing, and Freeman hits a dribbler down the first baseline. Mixon is off the mound and Bear hands the ball. He only has one play, and that's to first. The throw was in time, but Bill scored easily from third. The Dodgers have put their first run up on the board and have runners at second and third with only one out. While we're waiting for Hector Aponte to settle into the batter's box, Scott segues smoothly, we like to remind our listeners that Brandon Ford on East Adamo Drive is offering 0% financing on all their new and used trucks. Aponte is set in the batter's box, and Mixon is ready, Chip began again. Mixon will have to be careful because Aponte can usually put the bat on the ball. He's only had 36 strikeouts this season. Three pitches later. Aponte has run the count to 2-1 and one with one out and two on. Chip said as he glanced at the laptop next to him. This is Aponte's meat and potatoes, Scott said. He'll be looking for something in his zone. If he doesn't get it, he'll wait Mixon out. Chip continues. Mixon set and delivers. Aponte swings and lines a single to right field. Thorne will score easily, and Blanken is being waved home. Seaver scoops up the ball and fires it on one hop to home plate, and they nail Blanken. What a throw from Seaver, Scott enthused. That play at home wasn't even close. Now, with two outs and a man on first, Jordan Donner steps into the batter's box. Mixon looks a little unsettled. So, the catcher, Jimmy Fox, trots out to talk to him. Four pitches later. Mixon walked Donner on four pitches, putting runners on first and second with two out. And it looks like Torrance is going to make a change. He signaled to the bullpen, and it looks like he's bringing in the right-hander, Greg Cole. He's had an up-and-down year with three wins and six losses. His ERA is a very unimpressive 5.12. However, Greg has been much better of late. He got a save in one of the wildcard games and another in the ALCS final. This call to the bullpen is brought to you by Roger Harper Steakhouse, located just outside the stadium. Whether you want a filet mignon, ribeye, New York strip, or a porterhouse, it will be cooked exactly as you want. Every Thursday night is ladies' night, and every lady accompanied by her husband or boyfriend gets their steak for free. And at Roger Harper's, from 5 to 6 p.m., they have a two-for-one happy hour. Cole has finished his warm-ups, and Ray Matthews has stepped into the batter's box. And here's the first pitch, a long fly ball to deep left field. It caroms off the wall. With two outs, both runners were off with the pitch. Aponte will score easily, and Donner is being waved around third, and he'll also score as the throw is cut off. The Dodgers' bats seem to have finally awoken, Scott offered. They've scored four runs this inning so far. This game could turn against the Rays if they're not careful. With two out and no one on, the Dodgers opted to pinch hit. However, Danny Cruz grounded out to end the inning. Still, the Dodgers had closed the score to 7-4. But that was as close as they got. In the bottom of the eighth, Bobby Sheffield doubled to right. With no one out, Brad then singled, scoring Sheffield. He then stole second base and advanced to third on a long fly to right field. Then Brad scored on another long fly ball. Post-game summary. The Rays spoke loud and often, Ship reported. They scored nine runs on 12 hits. And Brad Seaver continues to amaze everyone. He had seven RBIs and scored a run. And we can't forget that great throw home that nailed Blanken. 
It was a truly inspired game by the Rays, Scott agreed. Tomorrow is a travel day because the series shifts to Los Angeles. The pregame will start at 8 o'clock Eastern Daylight Savings Time, Chips continues his wrap up, and the game starts at 9.05. Thanks for watching, and we hope you tune in for Game 6 of the World Series. Normally, the Rays didn't permit wives to fly on the team plane. But because of the team's comeback, they lifted the prohibition and offered a seat to any wife who wanted to go. Most wives accepted, but Brad wasn't sure whether Kim would come. The race jet left for LA about three hours after the game ended. It would be a long overnight flight, but the race felt having a full day in LA to rest made it worthwhile. Brad sat in his seat, waiting to see if Kim would make the flight. In fact, he had looked for her after the final out, but she had already left. It was again bringing flashbacks of his first marriage. With no Kim, Brad took three aspirins to quell his pounding headache and slept fitfully with his wife not there. Brad was able to get four more hours of sleep after arriving at the hotel before heading to Dodger Stadium for practice. Again, the practice was loose, and the players seemed truly relaxed. That night, Brad went to bed early and arose feeling well-rested. But he was still troubled by the fact that Kim was not there. He couldn't help but wonder what was going on with her. When Joe posted the starting lineup, Brad was pleased to find he was still starting in right field and batting eighth. The Dodgers seemed nervous and tight to everyone watching. And the game proved that they were. Fox Sports' sixth game wrap-up. Miracles of miracles, the Rays have tied the series three games apiece, Chip said joyfully. The Rays' offense was led again by Brad Seaver. He has been spectacular after being inserted as a pinch hitter in Game 4. Today, he doubled in the third inning to drive in the first run and then scored when the pitcher, Thor Grundle, looped a single into right field. Thor has only had two hits all season, so this was a big one. The Rays held on to their 2-0 lead until the top of the sixth when the wheels came off for the Dodgers. The Rays loaded the bases with Seaver up. He immediately doubled off the center field wall, scoring three runs. Bobby Sheffield then followed with a single to right, scoring Seaver. Roger Darby followed with a line drive over the right field wall. That upped the score to 7-0 in favor of the Rays. That was when the Dodger manager changed pitchers, bringing on Tito Velez, their second-best relief pitcher. Tito had 21 saves with an ERA of 2.33, but sloppy defense by the Dodgers turned a possible double play into runners at first and third. Then a double by Andy Pitts brought two more runs in, making it 9-0. The Dodgers managed to score two runs when Freeman put one over the left field wall with one on. Seaver had another single in the ninth, but he was left stranded at first. The final score saw the race coast to a 9-2 victory. Now everything comes down to the seventh and final game of the series. We'll be back tomorrow night with the pregame show at 8 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time and the seventh game of the World Series starting at 9.05. For Fox Sports, this is Chip Fair and Steve Amber thank you for watching. After the obligatory interviews in the locker room, Brad returned to the hotel room to get a bag of ice for his head and neck. He ran the tub and sat in it soaking. After 20 minutes, Brad heard someone in the other room. He was about to get out of the tub when Kim walked in and smiled at him. He was surprised but elated to see her. How do you feel, honey, she asked sweetly. Like a hundred-year-old man, Brad said with a weak smile. I feel like I'm all used up. I'm going to take some aspirin and go to bed. That's a good idea, Kim said as she followed Brad into the bedroom. She watched as he took the three aspirins and a sleeping pill. Kim sat with him until his breathing was deep and steady. Then quietly, she left him so her husband could get what rest he could. Brad slept for ten hours but awoke tired and still drained. One good thing, his headache was gone. Kim was there as soon as he stirred. How do you feel today, she asked with concern. Still like a hundred-year-old man, Brad smiled, elated that his wife was still there. He didn't care where she had been. She was here now, and that was all Brad cared about. Once the season was over, he'd make sure they spent more time together. But deep in the back of his mind was the fear that maybe she was waiting for the season to be over to leave him forever. Brad wasn't hungry, so they hung out at the pool for several hours. 
Then Brad took a nap before finally heading to the stadium. The atmosphere in the clubhouse was bubbling over with enthusiasm. The atmosphere didn't do much to help Brad shake the cobwebs. He didn't feel 100%, but he certainly felt infinitely better than last night. The final game of the series had the sports world in a tizzy. Dodger Stadium was packed well before batting practice started. There were reports that scalpers were charging $2,000 for a ticket. Brad's time in the batting cage was kind of a waste as his headache had come back. Sitting before his locker, Brad took his usual three aspirins and leaned against the metal wall behind him. Brad wondered if he should tell the skipper about his headache but decided to see if he was in the starting lineup. If Brad was in the starting lineup, he'd make a game-time decision about whether he was fit enough to play. But that plan went quickly out the window as one player after another came up to let Brad know how much they appreciated his efforts, and they told him they wouldn't let him down in this final game. After that, Brad knew it would be difficult to sit this game out if he was in the starting lineup. And when the starting lineup was announced, Brad was in right field and batting eighth. The decision was easy, Brad was going to play. Ninth inning play-by-play. -play. This has been an unbelievable pitcher's duel, Chip said as Andy Pitts stepped into the batter's box. Dodger pitchers Kodai Tanaka and Tyler Bowen have limited the race to one hit, and race pitchers Jack Sullivan and Gavin Miller have limited the Dodgers to two hits. Now the Dodgers have brought in Tito Villas to pitch to the Rays in the ninth, Scott offered. I think they're saving Sharman to mop up if they get a lead. Chip continued the play-by-play. Villas serves up his first pitch, and it's slapped to left field for a single. Pitts rounds first but retreats to the bag as Aponte fires the ball to second base. I think the Rays will have Sheffield try to lay a bunt down here, Scott offered. That makes sense, Scott. And Sheffield squares to bunt and misses. Strike one. Villas shook off the first sign but is ready and deals. Sheffield squares again to bunt. This one is fouled off, strike two. Now with two strikes, the question is whether the Rays will let Sheffield swing away? I think I'd still have him bunt, Scott offered. If Sheffield swings away, he could hit into a double play. They need to get the runner in scoring position. Here's the next pitch, and Sheffield squares and lays a bunt down the first baseline. Villes is off the mound quickly but only has a play at first. Now the Rays have a man at second with one out and Brad Seaver coming up. Seaver's bat has been silent today, Scott offered. He grounded out and struck out in his two times up. And he didn't look good either time. Two pitches later. The count is 0-2, and two, and I have to admit that Seaver looks really uncomfortable, Chip continued. Villas sets and fires. Seaver's hit a weak grounder between first and second. Bills and Thorne move to get it, but it sneaks through for a seeing-eye single. Matthews charges in and grabs the ball as Pitts is being waved home. Pitts slides in headfirst and is safe. The Rays have finally broken through and lead 1-0. Two pitches after Brad's hit. Pinch hitter Cleon Johnson has a 1-1 count on him. He's dug in and waits for the next pitch. It's a fastball, and he hits it on the ground to the shortstop, who flips it to second and then on to first for a double play. Now the Rays are only three outs from, perhaps, the most remarkable comeback in World Series history. The post-game recap. The Rays took a 1-0 lead into the bottom of the ninth inning, Chip began, but I don't think anyone expected how this game would finish. At the top of the ninth, the Rays manufactured a run. Andy Pitts singled, and Bobby Sheffield sacrificed him over to second. Then Brad Seaver hit a single that somehow made its way between first and second, bringing Pitts home from second. But then the Rays had to contend with the top of the Dodgers order. And leading off for the Dodgers was Sammy Bills, who promptly doubled off the left field wall. Then Thorne walked on four pitches, and Blanken was hit by a pitched ball. With the bases loaded and no one out, Ray Freeman was up to bat. Ray hit a sinking line drive that I'm sure every Rays fan thought was the World Series slipping through their fingers. But Brad Seaver came flying in, dove, and snatched the ball just before it hit the ground, rolled over, and tossed it to Williams at second, who stepped on the bag and then tagged the runner coming from first, a triple play. Only the second triple play in World Series history with the last one by the Cleveland Indians in 1920. So, this has been a miracle of miracles World Series. 
The Tampa Bay Rays are now world champions. Your thoughts, Scott? Every day since Brad hit the winning home run in Game 4, one moment in sports has bounced around my head. I'm talking about that moment during the 1980 Olympic Games when the American hockey team played the Russians. With less than 10 seconds left, Al Michaels yelled, Do you believe in miracles? Yes. And today, do we believe in miracles? Absolutely yes. Our producer just informed me the voting on the series MVP is in, Chip announced. And to no one's surprise, Brad Seaver was the unanimous choice. And I'm told he would have been the choice even if the race had lost the series. What a remarkable World Series for Brad Seaver, Scott added. He had 10 official at-bats, garnering 8 hits with 2 home runs and 14 RBIs. He now has the highest batting average of any player in a World Series, .800. Brad stayed through the craziness of the locker room, answered all the reporters' questions, had champagne poured on his head multiple times, was hugged by his fellow players at least twice, and received a hug from each coach, the manager, and even the team owner. But all the time he was there, all Brad could think about was Kim. She didn't show up at the ballpark. He prayed that she was waiting for him back at the hotel room. After a couple of hours, the press cleared out, and Brad could finally shower and catch a cab back to the hotel. However, Kim wasn't in the room when he arrived. Brad waited up late, but Kim never showed, and she still hadn't returned by the morning. Nor did Kim make the flight back to Tampa. At the beginning of the season, Brad had tried to make it clear to Kim that this would be his last year. He wondered if Kim had left him for good because of that decision. Fortunately, there was a large contingent of fans at the airport to cheer their team which buoyed his spirits a little. And an even larger contingent at the stadium when the bus dropped the team off. But when Brad finally reached their apartment, the depression returned as Kim wasn't there either. Tears streamed down his face, and he had to accept the possibility that she had left him for good. The following day, the city of Tampa Bay had arranged a parade through the downtown. And the next day, Brad's agent had him on the road for a three-week tour. It was exhausting with virtually every minute scheduled. But after a week, Brad had had enough. The tour meant nothing without Kim. Besides, he was totally exhausted. As Brad opened the door to their apartment, his hope that his wife was there waiting for him was dashed immediately. The air had that stale smell when no one had been there for days. Brad checked around the apartment, but there was nothing out of place. No one had been in their apartment since he was last there. After getting a cold beer, Brad went to their bedroom and began packing his clothes. He had decided that he'd head down to their farm. It wasn't really a farm as it had no animals. They called it a farm because the 22 acres had a farmhouse. They did have a vegetable garden, but that was long dead by this time of year. It was the only place that Brad could think that Kim might be. Brad's packing was interrupted by the phone ringing. He quickly grabbed the receiver as he hoped it would be Kim. Hello, Brad answered as his heart started to pound. Brad, I'm glad I caught you, the voice that was not Kim's responded. It's John Walker. I heard you left the promotion tour and took a chance that you'd be at your apartment. John Walker was the raised general manager. Mr. Walker, I'm kind of surprised to hear from you, Brad said. Are you upset about me leaving the tour? It was just too exhausting, and I just wanted to get some rest without someone telling me to go here or go there every minute of the day. No, Brad, I'm not upset at all. I know how that kind of media circus can really get to someone. I called to see if we could meet tomorrow morning, say about 10? I suppose so. I'm heading to my property near Arcadia, so it won't be a problem to swing by. Brad was at the Ray's offices at 9.55 and was ushered into John Walker's office. The general manager smiled, rose, and offered his hand. Thank you for seeing me, Brad, John said as they shook hands. And let me congratulate you on a fabulous World Series. Whether you know it or not, you've become a living legend. Brad blushed. I don't know about that. Please, sit, John motioned to a chair before him. Let me explain why I asked you to stop in this morning. I want to offer you a new two-year contract with a significant raise. Brad was stunned by the offer but quickly shook his head. No, 
I'm sorry, Mr. Walker, but I can't do it anymore. I understand that your regular season wasn't what you hoped it would be, John said soothingly. But what we envision in this contract is a player-slash-coach position. Brad, you're one of the best outfielders in the game, you run the bases with the best of them, and you are one of the few who knows how to bunt properly. There is so much you can teach the younger players. Brad, we want to keep you part of the Rays family. What do you think? Brad shook his head, and tears began to flow down his cheeks. There's a reason why I can't do it. I have a brain tumor and it isn't operable. I learned about it just before spring training. I'm sorry, I should have told the team, but I desperately wanted this last season. John was stunned by what Brad had told him, and tears began to form in his eyes. But he recovered quickly. Have you gotten a second opinion? I can put you in touch with some of the best surgeons. Brad again shook his head. I've been to three different doctors, including Dr. Steinman, who you know is one of the world's foremost brain surgeons. They've all told me the same thing. The tumor is deep in my brain, and there is no way it can be removed without killing me. When I was examined, the consensus was that I have maybe a year. That's why I can't sign. I'll probably be gone before spring training. Oh God, Brad, John said with deep emotion as the tears began to form again. I am so terribly sorry. Is there anything that I or the team can do for you? No, I've taken care of everything, Brad said as he stood and offered his hand. But John didn't take his hand. Instead, he came around the desk and hugged Brad tightly. As John hugged him, Brad's thoughts drifted to his concern as to where Kim was. If only he could find her, everything truly would be taken care of. He fervently hoped that she would be waiting for him at the farm. When John let him go, Brad turned and took four steps before pain exploded in his head, and he crumpled to the floor. When Brad woke up, he immediately knew he was in the hospital. He saw the wires going from his body to the machines and heard the beeping. He looked around, and his eyes came to rest on a figure near his bed. Tears began to flow down his cheeks. Kim was there with him. He no longer cared where she had been, she was with him now, and that was all that mattered. A nurse pushed her computer cart up to the nurse's station. Did you get Mr. Seaver's vitals? The head nurse asked. No, he was talking to his wife, the nurse explained. I thought I'd give them a little privacy first. The head nurse was about to say something when the alarm sounded that Brad Seaver was in cardiac arrest. A code blue was called, and the crash cart was there in less than two minutes. They worked on Brad for 15 minutes, but they could do nothing. He was gone. When there were only the two of them, the nurse said as her voice choked a little, I need to find Mrs. Seaver. She was here just a few minutes ago. I must let her know her husband is gone. Mary, the head nurse said gently, there is no way that Mrs. Seaver could have been here. She died in January of cancer. Epilogue The sporting world was shocked and saddened when the Rays announced the passing of Brad Seaver. None more so than the Tampa fans. With the outpouring of grief, the front office immediately arranged to have Brad lie in state in the stadium. The viewing was supposed to start at 9 in the morning, but people began lining up before 6. By 7, the police estimated the line was between 1 and 2 miles long. The decision was made to open the gates at 7.30. The line grew longer as the day went on, forcing the police to close more roads and reroute traffic. The stadium was surrounded by flowers, placards, and tokens of love. With the city's approval, the Rays extended the viewing hours until midnight and then to 2 a.m. Portable lights were set up to ensure the safety of the fans. Finally, at 2.30 a.m., the police began to turn people away, and the stadium gate was closed at 4.45 a.m. At 10 the following morning, a funeral procession left the stadium to carry Brad's body to Memorial Park Cemetery, where he was laid to rest beside his wife. The first home game of the next season found Tropicana Field filled to capacity. An American flag, the World Series championship flag, and a pennant were lowered but kept furled up. After a few words by the Rays owner, congratulating the team on their win and condolences for Brad, the three flags were unfurled. When the pennant opened, it revealed the number 23, Brad's uniform number. The crowd instantly broke into a roar and began chanting, Seaver! Seaver! 
Seaver. The celebration lasted a full five minutes. Cooperstown opened a permanent exhibit highlighting Brad's World Series performance in February of that year. They had taken Brad Seaver's highlights from the series and mixed them with music to create a 15-minute video. For the first six months, the video was so popular that the Hall of Fame was showing it to capacity audiences every 20 minutes. Brad's first wife, Cindy, had married and divorced four times. Tim Wilson and Cindy married a few months after her divorce from Brad was final. She stayed with Tim for two and a half years until he blew his arm out. After dumping Tim, Cindy took up with his teammate, third baseman Randy Abbott. Randy was a star for the Mets, with a $200 million eight-year contract. But Randy had a drug and gambling problem. However, he was also smart enough to insist that Cindy sign a prenup. Cindy wasn't happy about it, but she felt sure she could get it modified later. After two years of heavy partying, drug use, and gambling, the Mets laid down the law. Randy had to change his lifestyle, or they would dump him. And at that time in his career, Tim's skills were starting to slip. The Mets sent Randy to a treatment center. When Randy got clean, he realized that Cindy was cheating on him and threw her out. Cindy entered rehab for the first time. It didn't take. The only good thing about rehab for Cindy, or a bad thing depending on your point of view, was that she met one of the New York Jets players, Dexter Proud. He was an outstanding linebacker, but he had his own issues with drinking and partying. Four months after they met, Dexter and Cindy married. It was the beginning of the end of Dexter's career. Dexter was an alcoholic, but with Cindy's help, he became a drug abuser too. He only lasted a season and a half before the Jets released him. Neither Cindy nor Dexter bothered to file for divorce, they just drifted apart. The marriage did end, though, when Dexter overdosed one evening. Cindy was so busy partying that she didn't find out about Dexter's death until after his funeral. Cindy was deeply depressed by Dexter's death and the fact that she had been so consumed with her own pleasure that she missed the funeral. Within a day, Cindy checked herself into another rehab facility. She finished the program and left clean but Cindy was fooling herself that she had licked her drug addiction. Still, while she was still relatively clean, she met Tyler Watson, a financial advisor for one of the larger financial houses. Cindy was head over heels in love for the first time. But Tyler was just in lust. Still, Cindy maneuvered Tyler into marrying her. But within months, Tyler grew bored with his wife, and Cindy restarted her party life and drug addiction. When Tyler finally served Cindy with divorce papers, she went crazy. She created such havoc that Tyler had her committed for observation. After 72 hours of examination, it was decided that Cindy was still a danger to herself and others. She was formally committed. Cindy was furious at being kept in a mental institution and refused to do what she was told. Trying to engage her would send Cindy into a furious rant. The administration decided to just let her be for the time being. It wasn't until the baseball playoffs began and Cindy realized that Brad was playing for Tampa Bay that Cindy's behavior changed. She followed EA. CH game, including the pre-game and post-game shows. When Cindy got into a dispute in the dining hall, she was told that if she didn't settle down, they wouldn't let her watch any more games. Cindy settled right down. Cindy took one of her t-shirts and wrote the number 23 on it. Quickly, the staff realized that it was Brad Seaver's number. And shortly after that, they learned that Brad had been her first husband. When the Tampa Bay Rays won the World Series, Cindy was happier than she had been for as long as she could remember. But when Cindy learned that Brad had died suddenly, she collapsed, sobbing. Cindy had to be sedated. After that, Cindy became very withdrawn but participated in all the therapy. Cindy was released two months later. The only report about Cindy after her release was that she visited Brad's grave and left a single rose. After that, she disappeared, and no one knew what became of her. Brad's final conversation with his wife. When Brad woke up, he immediately knew that he was in the hospital. He saw the wires going from his body to the machines and heard the beeping. He looked around, and his eyes came to rest on a figure near his bed. Tears began to flow down his cheeks. Kim was there with him. He no longer cared where she had been, she was with him now, 
and that was all that mattered. You came, Brad said weakly. I was so afraid that you had left me. I love you so much. I would never leave you, Kim replied lovingly. But I was limited on how many times I could visit you. I should have passed on, but I've been waiting for you. Brad, I love you more than you can imagine. It's time for you to let go and come to me. Brad closed his eyes, and the hospital machines began to blare their alarms.